My name is Steve Wheeler. I'm um, in Plymouth in England. Uh, I'm, I'm on the map at the moment. You can probably see the, um, the, uh, the little map uh, there. Oh, it's gone. Just as I was speaking, it's gone. Um, but uh, on that map, you, you have a chance when it comes back, if it comes back, to actually put down where you are on that map to show everyone else in the world where you are. Um, so, uh, as I said, I, I'm Steve Wheeler. I, I used to be at Plymouth University. I still am. I'm a visiting research fellow there. But I'm now also an independent uh, learning innovations consultant. And I work, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a global citizen, just like you are, I guess. Uh, there's the map. It's back again. So perhaps those of you who are joining us, maybe you'd like to um, put your location, mark, mark your spot where you are in the world to show us where we are. At the moment, we have um, a lot of people in Europe and, and one or two in, in America. That's uh, some of our presenters. Um, and uh, I just wonder if there's anyone in Asia or South America or Africa or even over in New Zealand and Australia. Um, if you're joining us, then um, please say where you are. Um, but um, this is a, a good session that I, um, I've been asked to chair today. It, it's part of our um, uh, European Distance Learning Week, which has is jam-packed full of lots of webinars and online um, discussion and so on. It's been going on all week, and it's being organized through um, the European Distance and E-Learning Network and some of our partners. And I'm very pleased to, um, to welcome three speakers today. Uh, later on, you're going to be hearing from uh, Diana Ander, who's, who's from um, Romania. She'll be speaking later on about virtual reality. But before that, I'm going to introduce our first two speakers, who are going to do a double-hander together. And um, so let me introduce to you an old friend of mine, Marcy Powell, who I've known for <clears throat> a number of years, <clears throat> many, many years, more than we care either of us to remember. But um, Marcy is actually based over in Texas right now. You can see her marker there on the, um, on the map. So... Um, and uh, Marcy uh, has a long history of, of uh, working with technology and working with education. She was, in fact, the United States Distance Learning um, Association president, uh, past president. And she's also now the, the chair emerita of, of that organization. It's a very large, very powerful organization. And I've worked with USDIA myself once or twice. So I know about the American Eagle and all those different award ceremonies and so on. And um, she's now CEO and president of... Uh, virtually inspired an independent um you, you were were you is that, is that um, i'm I, i'm a ceo and president of marcy palm associates i'm a chief researcher and project director with virtually inspired anyway, I, I got, I got yes. wrong there, but, but so that'll be the last time i do that i promise you uh, so thanks marcy okay. and also accompanying her is susan aldrich uh, nice to meet you susan i think we've met once or twice before but I can't remember when or where because my, you know, as you get older, your your, your memory starts to go. I think in my case anyway. But um, let me just um, mention Susan um, is is actually working at Drexel University now, which is in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, one of my favourite states. I was over there not so long back, um, visiting uh, Lancaster County, which I'm sure you're you know you're familiar with, and um, and of course Philadelphia. And um, one of, one of um, Susan's uh, achievements in the past is one of, one of the books that, uh, that I, I've, I've seen is Wired for Success, Real World Solutions for Transforming Higher Education. Now, um, get hold of that book if you can. Um, it's available on Amazon. And um, you can see that where they're coming from because they're both going to now be talking about virtual reality in the context of education. So um, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, and um, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. I really appreciate it. Uh, Marcy and I are just indeed honored to join such distinguished guests uh, at Eden for the European Distance Learning Week. I think we can all agree that we live uh, in an age of exploding technology. Could I, could I ask a question about if our slides could be loaded up at this time? Terrific. Uh, so, Technology is not only, not only changing the world, but it's also transforming the way we teach on our campuses, and it's transforming the expectations that the students have when they arrive on our campuses. Uh, we're transforming beyond the old um, idea of instructivism in teaching to the new thought process of constructivism in education. We're trying to provide our students with learning experiences that are active, authentic, self-directed, and customized. 
The truth is that our students have a unique history with technology. They've grown up using the internet, using social media, smartphones, uh, video gaming worlds. So they're not only well acquainted with technology, but they're highly dependent on these digital tools that they use both in their personal lives as well as their professional lives. These tools empower them to connect, to collaborate with each other in ways that are immediate, they're efficient, they're interactive, and they're also self-directed. So these students expect the technology-enhanced education that we offer whether it's online or in person, to replicate this user experience. So we have to provide them with opportunities to discover and construct and apply expert knowledge and complex skills using a variety of different robust and interactive digital tools. These technologies are constantly evolving, which is a challenge for all of us in higher education. It makes it difficult for busy educators who, who, uh, who don't have a lot of time to research these tools, uh, to effectively implement them, to understand what's available for them, and how to optimize them in their classrooms. So in order to meet this challenge, Drexel University Online, a division of Drexel University, a private top 100 university in Philadelphia, we launched a rigorous research project to study the future of technology-enhanced teaching and learning and, and Marcy and I scoured the world looking for these pockets of innovation that um, would increase our body of knowledge about what's occurring and expand the field of possibilities in higher education. So next slide, Marcy. So to, to share this goldmine of innovation and information, we created an award-winning website called Virtually Inspired. It showcases some of the brightest minds, some of the best practices in connected learning, while also building an open and evolving repository of replicable ideas. And many of the members from Eden have contributed their fantastic ideas, and we hope you'll continue to do so. So for today's webinar, um, uh, we would like you to be able to peek into what's possible as we share some of our research on the latest and greatest virtual learning enhancements and experiences that we have found in our global search around the world. Marcy? Simply, virtual reality, <laughs> we're creating, <clears throat> there we go, creating virtual learning environments that, that, that will feel and respond much like the real world. Uh, we want students to engage, explore, interact, and manipulate objects that are within them. And consequently, they are, they are able to safely practice complex procedures. They can master difficult concepts, experience firsthand some of the world's greatest museums and natural wonders, historical events, notable landmarks, uh, <clears throat> from training fighter pilots to, uh, to surgeons to emergency responders to field engineers. Uh, all of these are value from, there we go, some of the, I was waiting for the pictures to come up, it threw me for a minute. Uh, they can value, be in virtual, they can take virtual risk in virtual worlds to gain real world experiences. And that's the way a lot of people outside of education, uh, formal education, are using the technology. And then while virtual reality really requires special headsets, or glasses, like the ever popular, popular uh, Oculus Rift, or the low-end Google Cardboard. The selection is growing now at price points that are highly affordable, under 20 euro for headsets, and as low as 4 euro for decent glasses. That's pretty good. When you look at uh, high-end, for example, Investments of more than $1 billion from companies like Google, AT&T, and Alibaba, and five years of development later, Magic Leap finally released its headset that uses a different kind of virtual reality. So this is probably your, on the far end of the spectrum, highest end. Uh, Magic Leap 1 is a head-mounted virtual retina display, and it superimposes 3D computer-generated gener imagery, imagery can everyone say that word? Imagery. Over real world objects 
by projecting a digital light field into the user's eyes. And right now, I don't think it's available in Europe because of some of the standards they're working within, but AT&T did buy exclusive rights to offer it in their stores at a cost, are you ready for this, $2,300. Now, on the lower end, uh, students worldwide, particularly those with limited access to resources, they can use these clip-on glasses. And these are the ones that cost around 4 to 10 euro, and they easily snap onto a, a smartphone. I like those better than the Google Cardboard in that they don't, uh, they're, they're compact, fold up, put in your pocket, you can save them, and they don't wear and tear like cardboard can. Susan? Consideration has to, yeah, thank you. Consideration also has to be given uh, to the rate at which virtual reality is being adopted and, and also how soon uh, it could reach a critical uh, mass. Once that happens, the students will expect for their learning content uh, to be adapted to utilize this technology. So just how quickly is virtual reality uh, gaining wide access? Earlier this year, um, uh, the Dubai Mall, one of the world's largest shopping complexes, came to VR Park, an indoor theme park spanning two floors, over 75,000 square feet of space, offering a wide variety of VR experiences, including physical rides, many of which use the high resolution, uh, uh, high uh, uh, FOV star VR headset. And China opened a $500 million VR theme park. These parks are both just tremendous examples of some of the many ways the virtual reality is being adapted worldwide. But just how quickly is it gaining momentum on our campuses for teaching and learning? I guess my visual image is frozen in place there. so. As long as you can hear my voice, that's the most important thing. Uh, HTC has been making inroads into the education system in China with its startup. Um, uh, Marcia, you're going to have to help me pronounce this one. Is it, is it Vive? Vive EDU. Vive, Vive EDU. Vive EDU so, or Vive uh, EDU. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Vive EDU centers around both university level and K through 12 education programs using H HTC Vive and now HTC Vive Focus. So the company's um, uh, standalone VR headset um, uh, is untethered by cords, which um, is just another advancement. Uh, Vive um, EDU was founded by HTC in 2017. And it's headed by Dr. Sun Wei, the founding president of the School of Software at Beijing University Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. He's a professor at the School of Computer Science at Florida State University as well. So with a starting focus on university level education and vocational school sectors such as mechanical engineering, uh, Vive uh, EDU branched out to K-12 education in 2018. Uh, boasting a comprehensive virtual reality approach to learning technology and science and engineering, mathematics, and art for children. The system boasts 100,000 plus educational virtual reality assets in a cloud-based content library so teachers can create their own coursework and tailor it to their specific lecture, letting students explore the workings of an engine or CAD created models to help students see and interact while they're learning. Marcy? Marcy? So last year, Google bought, brought us Google Expeditions, which enable virtual tour experiences, right? This year, we now have Google, what they call a tour creator, which is a web-based tool that lets educators 
easily build a virtual reality tour of our own using imagery from Google Street View as well as uh, our own 360 photos. So you, it's designed to simply drag and drop interface. So Tour Creator lets you string together a pathway through the world using Google Maps as a basis and then adding in your self-captured 3D and 360 photos to highlight. Uh, it could be a personal trip. It could be an educational trip. And then it allows us to add points of interest detail to the tour with self-created text. So access to virtual reality content is really rapidly increasing, and there are a number of exciting VR apps that can be provided to students as a supplementary learning resources in just about every discipline. Uh, we can employ it to enhance subjects like Egyptology, which was where Harvard University, for example, created a 3D model of the Giza Plateau. And Giza 3D is a historically accurate, and it's used for scientific research for students who are studying Egypt. Some universities are using virtual reality to enable their online students or prospective students to take a virtual and fully immersive tour of their campuses. So some companies have created apps that allow students to experience a different kind a virtual tour from basic biology to medical school uh, uh, classrooms. Instructors struggle to teach some of the complexities and particularly the interrelationships of the various systems in a human body. Remember that most medical schools in the past have used cadavers uh, to teach medical students. Now with virtual reality, they're able to see all of the systems working and functioning uh, simultaneously. Uh, so, so thanks to virtual reality, there are an increasing number of really exciting digital options that are available. The Anatomia app enables advanced students to take a non-invasive tour through the body to learn more about its various systems, while InMind uh, facilitates a gamified journey through the human brain, uh, and in cell is a virtual reality action gamified journey inside the human cell. So here are just a couple of screenshots. The body VR traverses the bloodstream. So by harnessing the power of virtual reality, our history, faculty, arts instructors have just a wealth of options for conducting virtual field trips, hosting authentic experiences in every possible location from world-renowned museums um, to remote regions of the world to famous battlefields. For example, uh, Eon Reality's King Tut VR is an audio-narrated 360-degree tour of the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh, King Tutankhamun, which provides a unique opportunity to examine the intricate artifacts of the New Kingdom period in Egyptian history. Marcy? <clears throat> and YouTube has hundreds of thousands of 360, 3D, and VR videos already out there available for us to view. For example, if you just simply search 360 HD Nat, Nat Geo, which stands for National Geographic, that say, uh, that's what I typed in here on this slide. Any topic you might be interested in brings up. You can imagine swimming among the coral reefs or staring into the eye of a miniature Category 5 hurricane. That's possible with YouTube. Boulevard VR is a group of professional curators and educators that have put the concept of virtual reality into work in an app um, that they describe as gaming meets museum tour. Boulevard VR uses one uh, where you can peruse the world's great art collections through the eyes of a museum curator. By attaching the inexpensive VR glasses to your smartphone, virtual Art museum goers can enjoy a full body experience. Virtual art museum 
uh, that has the great exhibits in the world and in the comfort of your own home. And that's an innovative team of developers, and they're ultimately envisioning that there'll be a giant VR platform that will connect a wealth of interrelated arts, cultural, and architectural sites, and thereby would allow us as users to customize a tour experience based on our individual uh, interest. I like that. Um, Tilt Brush is a painter type app that lets uh, students move beyond traditional art media and create a virtual space of shareable 3D masterpiece of our own art uh, using a palette of dynamic brushes to create texture and volume. And students unlock the possibilities of painting in a room scale VR environment. I, I wore one of those and tried it, and it is absolutely amazing. Now, look at Oral Roberts University. And they've been pioneering integrating VR across the board, across system-wide the entire universe, uh, the entire university. The uh, institution has not only streamlined the process for their faculty members who want to transform their courses with VR, but they're dramatically changing the teaching and learning experience for their campus and online students through truly, they have an innovative global learning center. The faculty contain the in this facility, faculty can go to creation rooms. They're designed specifically for the instructors. As an instructor, I walk in and put in my 10-digit phone number, and the room comes to life specifically for me. If I'm teaching live, for example, it automatically connects the room to my online students through Zoom video conferencing. Uh, if I am not teaching live, it instinctively brings up the VR platform and ob object repository with access to all the tools that I need to create a lesson. And so, for example, I could design a lesson around the intricacies of the human heart, and a professor could quickly find the necessary 3D objects and video footage, as well as click a button and add voiceover and then you can guide students through the lesson that way. Uh, likewise, the link could be generated so that students may access the, le the lesson on whatever device they want to use. Uh, for the full VR effect, of course, they can wear the headset. And if they're in the developing countries that Oral Roberts University serves, they could wear the less expensive clip-on viewers. For, exa for example, uh, specially designed headsets and other wearable equipment enable holography, an another form of virtual uh, reality that uses three-dimensional freestanding images created with photographic projection. And pioneering devices like the Microsoft HoloLens headset are rapidly being developed to extend this powerful learning technology in novel and previously unimaginable directions. Uh, the screen that you're seeing here is from Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. They collaborated to create an anatomy and physiology course for HoloLens. With holography, students can cut into a virtual three-dimensional human body to understand the intricacies of and the connections among all of its different systems organs, skeletal, vascular, and nervous systems. The Russian-based company, Hologroup, is also working with Microsoft HoloLens. And uh, Hologroup is making science education come alive by combining the real world with the digital world to create a truly visual and interactive mixed reality learning experience. Marcy? Marcy, I can't hear you. Marcy, we can't hear you. Marcy, we can't hear you. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes? Yeah. yeah. You can hear me? Good. Yes. Yeah. Good, good. Yes. Yeah. Fact, by dynamically inter uh, interweaving the 3D holographic images, graphics, and yeah. data onto the real-world environment, the company's Hollow Study app 
provide students with a more sophisticated understanding of complex scientific concepts that are hard to convey through normal textbooks and lectures. And of course, while these extended reality technologies enhancements afford numerous advantages, when it comes to supporting a constructivist education mod model, there are certain accessibility challenges that we need to consider going forward. Uh, to begin with, educators can potentially find it challenging to locate learning objects uh, for a specific course. And trying to do that can be time consuming. Then how do I integrate them? That can be frustrating. This is where OERs, Open Educational Resources, play a vital role. Um, along with some of the low cost and free repositories like Sketchfab. At Drexel University Online, uh, we have assembled a one-of-a-kind uh, repository. We call it the Artifacts Plus. It's kind of play, uh, kind of a play on virtual reality, but it's more than that. So, uh, the Artifacts Plus is a repository that we created that, and it houses over 250,000 learning objects that are linked within a system for instructors to easily grab and integrate content into their courses. This repository uh, will be available to faculty through the Blackboard interface and includes virtual and mixed reality images along with 3D objects and 360 degree panoramas. The instructors or the instructional designers can search for terms specific to their courses, like they can um, uh, type in pulmonary system, or they can type in brain, or they can type in um, uh, Egyptian artifacts. Um, they can download the images that they want to use easily into their class in a very simple plug and play uh, type of, of format. The students will be able to access and explore these virtual objects on any device from smartphones and laptops to VR glasses and trackpads. There, there are also certain access, accessibility challenges uh, uh, what, for all of us to consider going forward. Um, some of these tools have to be appropriately developed with the human sensory limitations in mind, particularly people who have vertigo and other challenges uh, have to be very careful in this environment. So the tools have to be uh, developed appropriately from visual and auditory to kinesthetic perception. And, and although these limitations are increasingly being addressed through constant improvements in the technology design, they're still very much worth noting as we're uh, trying to serve our, uh, our students who may have uh, challenges uh, uh, in our courses. So the, um, I want to make sure that also we continue to do research in this space and that and we're very interested in hearing more from all of our colleagues about the research that they're doing uh, about the impact that these technologies have on our students and also on their abilities. Marcy? Yeah, we just need to really conclude uh, real quickly. And so there's some practical questions and some other questions that I think we should consider from accessibility and uh, practical side. I mean, here's just four, and then we'll wrap it up so we can turn over to you for questions. Um, what metrics, both quantitative and qualitative, should be used to ensure that the technology promotes inquiry-based collaborative and authentic learning in a way that complements the course curriculum and the field of study while supporting better learning outcomes? Or what will we need to be in place for strategically and tactically and operationally to ensure that students and faculty alike are able to use this technology effectively? Are there applications and devices already available in the marketplace that can be cost effectively integrated to meet desired outcomes? And if the implementation means creating something new, are there opportunities to collaborate with industry partners, qualified vendors, other like-minded institutions? Uh, to expand the resource pool and identify potential synergies. Uh, so those are just a few of the questions. Susan? Uh, there's no doubt that the future of connected learning and teaching holds endless possibilities for harnessing the power of virtual reality technology to enhance the power of education for our students. And webinars such as this one help us forge active alliances for embracing a new education model 
uh, that's grounded in learning experiences that our students have come to expect. So thank you again for the honor of being with you today. We look forward to co a collaborative discussion with you. So thank you, Steve, back to Susan you. Susan and Marcy, thank you so much for um, taking the time to present that fascinating presentation to us today. Um, I'm sure everyone here was, was um, riveted by everything you said there. Some of the imagery, in, in, in fact, was very stunning, I, I thought, as well. And I think you've sold it to me. You know, I, I was a bit skeptic um, beforehand about VR, but, but I think you sold me on the idea. Uh, so everybody who's watching this now, a small select pe a group of people, about, I think 17 participants here from around Europe and uh, the States, um, you have the chance now to, um, to ask, ask questions of Susan and Marcy. Two ways you can do this. One, you can uh, type in your questions into the chat system, or if you have a, a microphone uh, and you want to ask the question directly, I think we're geared up to give you um, a slot, an audio slot, and what you must do there is to put your hand up, and that means you have to click the button at the top of your screen with the little man with the hand that goes up like that. Click on that, and I'll see you, and, uh, and um, we'll um, allow you to, um, to come in and, and speak your question. Um, so, and, and while you're thinking about your questions, uh, maybe I could uh, pose a couple of questions to you. Um, I mean, the first question was was about the complexity of of, um, of, of manipulating objects and, and, and tools and, and, and so on. Uh, in other words, you know, to, to interact with your environment in, in VR. And I just wondered what your what your kind of ideas were about the barriers to that. You know, the barriers barriers to adoption. For instance, what about um, how long does it take people maybe you know, users to actually um, become familiar to the extent that they can manipulate tools, almost as if they were doing it for real. Well, I can, this is Susan, I can start and Marcy, uh, maybe you can jump in uh, afterwards. When we launched the, the, the Artifacts uh, Plus repository, we, we, we rolled it out to our instructional designers first and gave them the entire summer to just understand what was in the repository, to, to figure out where some of these artifacts might be useful, to figure out where they might work and where um, maybe they wouldn't work. Um, we also have a couple of our most senior faculty who teach online uh, who are also in a test drive mode with it as well. They, they have to be in a low risk or no risk environment to just practice and think through what's available to them uh, b because otherwise the faculty just yeah. don't have time. And so, w so without any requirements of any of them, uh, we're going to be opening up the, uh, the repository to all of them, uh, hopefully in January, and just allow any faculty across the university to go in. We have Black, a Blackboard platform, so they go into Blackboard, go into the repository, and then they can just plug and play and, and work with it. So as long as we don't have any specific requirements initially, except to just explore, consider, and determine what might work in their classrooms, I think that's going to have much greater success for us in the long term than actually having a requirement that they use it. So I'll turn it over to Marcy. Maybe you have some other suggestions. I think some of the challenges you have uh, for most students or most faculty is finding that content. I think repositories like VR Artifacts, V Artifacts Plus works for that. Then to narrow it down because the objects for VR are growing so fast. When uh, when Oral Roberts first started their repository, they only had 10,000 objects. Um, our repository, at, at the repository at Drexel, has over 250,000 mm. objects. Mm. Now to try to go through that is overwhelming. And so uh, being able to tag all of those with labels that fit whatever the course is matters. Uh, so if the, um, my phone is going off, oh, there we go. I don't want it, I turn on vibrate, but that vibration is making a noise. Um, the, so being able to put labels that fit the terms of the degree, like the program that you're working on, heart versus cardiac or pulmonary or, or um, the, uh, you know, the different terms, you can use various uh, terms for medical terms versus the average um, 
person terms. Uh, so that matters. Making it real easy, like uh, Eon Reality has a lesson plan building platform that to me is one of the easiest ones out there. It's very expensive right now. So hopefully it will become more affordable for educators. Um, and that it allows you to find your object, put it in, stick your own little labels where you want them, and it's just intuitive. I think intuitive, Steve, is the key. Uh, for us to be successful, we have to make it easy for them to find objects, yeah. easy for them to yeah. clip exactly what they want, and easy for them to put it into a lesson. Yeah, I think user experience, user design, um, intuitive um, interfaces, the idea of transparent technology that you can see through to learn. I think this is all important uh, for all of us as um, learning technologists and, and educators today. And I'd love to come back and, and um, if we've got time, I'm sure we will have later on to give you a follow-up question on that. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn towards uh, to our, um, our, our, our viewers and, and listeners. And um, I'm going to go over to Therese Bird, who um, has a question. In fact, um, if you don't mind, Therese, for, the, for shortness, I'll, I'll actually read the question out for everybody. It's on the chat line. I have a question about those clip-on specs. Is that as immersive as Google Cardboard or equivalent set of goggles? Is it as immersive or more immersive? What do you think? Have you had experience of them yourself? I think it is. Um, I, have, I have several pair. And yeah, so when you put it up against your eyes, even though Google Cardboard has the sides um, and the clip-ons don't, I still think the way you put it in your eyes, uh, you don't need that peripheral. It doesn't hurt your peripheral vision. So I think that it's the same lenses that Google Cardboard uses. It's just a different format and real easy to transport. So I think it gives you the same experience that Google Cardboard does. Susan, anything to add to that? No, we actually have um, purchased them. We're doing, going to do a virtual tour, as we were mentioning before, a virtual reality tour of the campus. And so all of our new online students were sending them a set of the glasses that are branded with the Drexel name on them. We bought them in volume, but they're about $4 US uh, for them. So fantastic. Uh, fantastic price for just giving our students uh, uh, an exciting opportunity to see our campus uh, from a distance. Absolutely. And it, wor it works, I'm assuming, off a smartphone, just like um, Google Cardboard, does it? Yeah. 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 So, so immediately accessible uh, tools for most students. Um, that, 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 this, this is starting to kind of pan out as something which um, Clearly, higher education is is, is um, becoming involved in um, special, specialist um, learning as well. You know things like medical education. But um, Thomas Twisig here, who has a, an interesting question about um, whether this would also be useful in primary and secondary schools, and 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 also, um, you know, is there enough content? I think is his question here at the moment for primary and secondary schools. Could it be adapted to that kind of level of education? Marcy. Yeah, I would love to answer that. As that that's my original background in teaching was primary, secondary level. Um, it is being used all over the world in primary and secondary schools. There is content galore out there. Google Cardboard, when they first came out with Google and Google Expeditions, they really targeted the primary, secondary level before they targeted higher ed. Uh, the VIBDU that Susan mentioned in China started out at higher ed, but then they turned around and started targeting the um, primary secondary schools. So what we're seeing worldwide is that it's being very widely adopted, generally in classrooms, because they're not online students, so to speak. Uh, so they'll have, have entire sets of Google Cardboard that you can bring in the classroom, and you have 30 kids watching it at one time uh, with a teacher instructing them. So the content is, there's a plethora of content out there for primary, secondary level. Um, and uh, it's already being very widely used that way. You can even take 
a cereal box. I think it's in America we have the Wheaties brand yep. that actually has a Google Cardboard on the back of the box, and you can cut out the box that has the lenses inside, kind of like a Cracker Jack surprise, and you can make your own set. Um, so it is being widely adopted at that age. Well, I think um, the important thing for us all to remember is that as um, technology has become adopted mainstream in, in entertainment, so schools and colleges and so on will, will also adopt them quite widely as well. I think that, that's always been the case with new technologies, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I think Diane, I, who we're going to hear from in a moment, um, also has an important question. Well, it's a comment here, really. Um, she says um, we should allow children from the ages of eight to fourteen to become creators. Um, you know, and I, I know that Diane is going to talk about user-generated content later on, anyway. So um, we'll, 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 maybe we'll come back to you on that one as well, Diana, later on, and we can have a four-way discussion on that with the audience as well. But um, I have another question here. I think from. Um, Hannah, is it? I think Hannah in, in uh, Hannah Anderson in Sweden, I believe. Do you know about any research on other? Um, well, it's just moved up uh, on other negative effects than cyber sickness when using VR. Now, I, you know, I, I was interested in this question myself, and I made a comment about the idea of cyber sickness. I think in um, technical terms, we call it corruption, the corruption effect, which is kind of inertia sickness caused by. Um, your visual cortex being overstimulated, and, and but, be, but you're actually not moving at all. Um, so that's one issue. But are there any other issues? She's asking. Any other negative effects? Who wants to answer that, Susan? Uh, uh. Actually, that's what we're researching uh, now. I I know that the people who have uh, a condition called vertigo uh, cannot um, uh, really uh, have an extremely difficult time in uh, in this environment. So, uh, are, are actually cautioned not to uh, not to use the goggles in in this VR uh, space because it does trigger their vertigo. And we've had that situation happen here with staff on our campus. So. Uh, we're still exploring the ramifications of all these technologies. I, I think uh, um, Diane asked this question, and, and I see that, that Thomas uh, has also asked a question. What we're hoping is that all of our colleagues around the world will do more research in this area, contribute that research through uh, conferences and events like this, because uh, the technology is just so new, we don't really know the long-term ramifications. We do know that when we create rich, immersive learning environments for our students and give them uh, 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 technologies, whether it's gaming, simulations, uh, virtual reality, any of these technologies, if the students are given these opportunities for learning, they practice, practice, practice. So they, they are four times, they spend four times the amount of time with these kinds of immersive technologies than they do if we give them content in uh, a video format or in a reading format. So we know they spend the time with these technologies, and we know we can measure their learning as a result of that, but we don't know enough about the different individual technologies themselves in order to determine if there's some that enhance learning better than yeah, others. I, I think I, I tend to agree with that. The, the, the idea of affordances is important here, isn't it? The, the idea of perceived effectiveness and what you can and cannot do with the technology. In my own university here in Plymouth, somebody has, has been doing some research on trying to obviate some of the problems with cyber sickness um, uh, using um, varying speeds of rendering, image rendering. Um, I'm not sure what the conclusion of that research is, whether it's still ongoing, but there is an issue around um, rendering speeds and latency effects, isn't there, as well? Marcy? Yes, I agree, Stephen. Some of the latest uh, some of the latest improvements have been that they're finally getting those rendering speeds and the, the, uh, up to the level where it's reducing or completely eliminating the cyber sickness. Um, the brain still finds it tricky, however, uh, and which is also uh, big on primary and secondary students, is that full immersion when you put on the headset, you are losing your sense of where you are. 
Um, and even though someone tells you to step off the cliff, <laughs> we're not willing to do it, even though we know we're standing in the middle of a, a conference room or a, a classroom on a solid floor experiencing it. We can't make ourselves do what they told us to do because our brain is tricked that we're really in that environment. So the, the speed limit, the speed, speed levels rendering have gotten, have improved greatly, dramatically, reducing a lot of the cyber sickness. But I think, I still wonder what we're doing with our brains when we trick, try to trick it that you're somewhere I, as a you're psychologist, not. I'm fascinated by this discussion, and I'd love to continue this. We're, we're going to have to stop at that point. But I, you know, one, you know, one thing I will say is that I think there are incredible applications for this for things like cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, pho phobia treatments, and so on in the future. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure this um, still nascent technology will will emerge into um, a lot of different applications over the next few years as we're watching it. And yes, Erasmo, Diana, is, is, is another, um, Erasmo is actually um, an, an augmented reality tool, isn't it? But um, maybe we'll hear from, from, from Aunt Diana in a minute about that. So thank you, Susan and Marcy, for now. Uh, we will be coming back uh, with a full plenary later on, but I'm, I'm going to say thank you for now and move on to our next speaker, who is Diana Andoni, who uh, I first met, <laughs> we were discussing this, weren't we, um, se several um, years ago, I think it was nine years ago now, we were saying, um, when um, I sat across the table from Diana as her um, examiner for her PhD all those years back. And I think, if I remember rightly, your two supervisors were Lynn Pemberton and John Drum. is that correct? At Brighton University. <laughs> yes, she's nodding, which is, so my, mem my memory is good. And um, Diana is actually... That's your memory. Yes. Right. Diana is actually the director of the e-learning um, uh, department now, the e-learning faculty at um, uh, Polytechnica University of Timisoara in um, Romania, and she's also, like me, a fellow fellow of Eden. <laughs> and um, so, uh, I think uh, I, I don't want to say any, anything more. I'm just going to hand straight over now to Diana. Thank you for joining us, Diana, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Hello to everybody from Romania, Timisoara. So we are uh, all of us in different time zones. Uh, Steve is exactly on GMT, um, <laughs> plus two hours, and I think Susan uh, is about plus five, no, or something like that. And uh, similar with Marcy. So this is really an international or global event. So my presentation is mainly trying to focus a bit more differently because we were trying to give you a full perspective on what you can do in education if you are um, trying to introduce at least virtual reality or a tiny bit of augmented reality. As uh, I've been already introduced, I'm in the Polytechnica University of Timisoara, Romania. Uh, my presentation was included in the Polytechnica days. Uh, we've been established as a university, and in the royal degree was signed on November 11, 20, uh, 1920. By 2020, we will celebrate 100 years of a Romanian university. In less than two weeks from now, Romania will celebrate its 100th birthday as a country <laughs> after the end of the First World War, which we know, at least in Europe, is uh, celebrating now the end of this uh, uh, First World War. I'm the director of the Learning Center. We recently celebrated 20 years of distance education and 20 years since the establishment of the e-learning center. We do quite a lot more um, since the beginning than distance education. Distance education now is probably about 10-15% of the work which we do is more digital education and to cater for the entire university students. Uh, virtual campus and blended learning and everything, plus a lot of projects and research in uh, using uh, different tools in education. So basically, my ideas recently, oops, sorry, uh, came from the how to say the research which I started somehow, uh, which Steve also mentioned during my PhD, which was about the use of digital students. Uh, I mean, the, the, how they use the tools and how they can be integrated. Education. I moved from that idea to something which I call open lifelong learning students, something which I consider that uh, us, especially traditional university 
I come from a very traditional university, 100 years old, brick and walls. Uh, we have uh, 19,000 students which are coming in campus, in labs, in um, big amphitheaters and things like that. So our distance education students are a very, very, very big, very, very small minority, not, not such a big number. So my problem is that the students nowadays, we don't really encourage them in the university to learn all the new 21st century skills or how to learn independently and digitally for their entire life. So a lot of these tools and uh, things which we I will try to show to you today are coming from one of these core beliefs which I have and my team has also that we need to do something to encourage our students to learn independently and digitally uh, for their entire life. And we need to start doing this from the university. And similarly, to encourage them to become creative create, uh, creators. This is a Friedman idea about creative creators, which are students which can go the extra mile and they can do several extra things and not just um, create the normal project work during the class, but try to combine knowledge and ideas and information from different areas and sectors, even through informal learning, and implement them in the traditional universities or in the traditional learning, and then encourage them to become really creative at the end. So, that's how we are using this. We are using education. There are a lot of examples, and you just seen some of them, so I will not go over them. This is an, another example which I added here because I've seen that uh, Marty and Susan uh, wasn't including, which is related a bit more a combination of VR and AR, and it's more for children uh, because it's encouraging them to learn basic knowledge by using VR and AR and playing and using books uh, or iPads for that. And usually, the art use in education is based on facilitation with inaccessible environment. So everything, all the sparks in the art in education are coming from this. How you can use something where physical location um, is difficult or where it's very difficult to reproduce something. I remember many, many years ago, I mean, almost probably 15, 20 years ago, I saw the first examples of the art on volcanology, so how to learn about volcanoes, how the volcanoes erupt and what's happening there. And also, as we know, uh, even uh, those uh, pilots which are trained nowadays to fly, they started for more than 25, 30 years in simulators, which are using full virtual reality environment. So basically, that's the main idea of the VR use in education. Very recent article on the next web, uh, next web from August 2018 says that VR education is promising but expensive. It's based on a study and a questionnaire run by HubSpot, a very large uh, marketing agency from the United States, and uh, shows the experience of different um, educators but also trainers. That's what I, why I'm showing it because it was. Um, also related to training in companies uh, by using VR and how this can be done and what's their experience. So their conclusion, which is somehow also in a way my conclusion, is that VR won't be the best tool for every single uh, learning situation because probably not every educational situation will require the use of virtual reality. But virtual edu reality education can be very well suited for situations where physical location matters or where a non-virtual version of that location is very, very difficult to, to, to reproduce or to encourage to do. We also have several uh, courses about virtual real reality now. Even a MOOC run on Udemy for about three years now, three years and a half, um, when since they, they've been doing it in different um, versions and using and so on. And it's uh, quite, um, how to say, not expensive at all, as you can see. And it's become quite uh, popular and quite famous. Also, there are several uh, VR e-MOOCs where you can uh, see how VR uh, reality, uh, some very small bits of VR are used in MOOCs. MOOCs are not, uh, massive open online courses for those which are not really aware of this. I'm pretty sure everybody's aware about this. One of the first MOOCs in uh, VR uh, was done by a computer science student, uh, is the CS560, a very, very famous 
uh, course, and I will put here um, the link to the YouTube, so you will be able to see one of those examples and so on. This was run for three years in a row now by the students in um, different areas in the Sanders Theater in uh, in America in the Penn University. So that that's one of the best uh, best examples which we use now of using also international experience or international audience with location audience by using virtual reality. And uh, I you have here in the presentation two links with uh, two of those examples and the things which are uh, there. Another example which is uh, a very good example and uh, I've seen a bit of this also in uh, Marcus and Susan's excellent presentation is Lightly, which is part of the K-12 curriculum again in the um, in United States and Earpod, which is um, also showing a lot of examples about uh, uh, lessons about standard curriculum in K-12 in the United States. So all of these are basically examples of doing things which were already developed by educationalists and they are implemented in education uh, in different areas. But what I want to show to you is more something related with code spaces. Um, code spaces is a virtual reality uh, tool which uh, uh, the code spaces edu is free for educational purposes. I think up to 50 users, 50 users in a classroom, as uh, far as I'm aware. But it's also very, very inexpensive and a very powerful tool. And there are several examples where you can do a lot of things with those. And that's uh, one of the examples which I will post again here is an example where you have, sorry, yeah. Uh, where you have um, um, a story, in fact, is the is the, um, um, the Lion King story told using the uh, code spaces, and it was done in a collaboratively way with uh, children and with uh, um, graphic animators and teachers. Uh, the project which I want to talk to you has become probably one of my favorite projects to talk about, especially when I'm speaking about virtual mobility or virtual reality and augmented reality, is the TalkTech project, which I started together with my colleague uh, Mark uh, Friedenberg from Bentley University from Walton, United States, which is in Massachusetts. And for 10 years now, we run about 50 students from Romania, 50 students from the United States, where we fairly, we pair them jointly in two, two Romanians and two Americans. And they need to produce a multimedia artifact, we call it. In the last three years, this was an augmented reality or virtual reality experience, which they needed to do jointly. Until now, well, more than 1,000 students were involved, which graduated, uh, finished last year. And we are very happy with the idea that we had no dropout. All of them were keen on finalizing the project, which uh, all of us, which we are coming from the university <laughs> area, we know is the biggest challenge which we had. Uh, briefly over the project goals is to work with students from another country by using collaborative multimedia tools to produce something, to communicate with international par partners, and to produce a tangible work within a designated period of time, which is usually eight weeks in every day. What, uh, what are their abilities which uh, they are enhanced or improved or even gained through this project is obviously multiculturality and international collaboration and a source of entrepreneurship because we see they, they can do a lot of things with much more simple tools than uh, they believe that they need expensive tools and a lot of money to start doing this. These are mainly IT students, so they're in um, areas with ICT. They also improve and they learn how to work in a global workspace environment, and we improve their digital skills. Uh, Talk Tech 2016, 17, and 18 was related to virtual real reality artifacts and, and augmented reality, and these are my main questions about that. So basically, the students need to identify based on topics which we give them, like a shop or a coffee shop from Timshara and Boston, then a stadium, a football stadium, or any other stadium from Timshara and Boston, or a museum, or any other university or a park. And they need to identify what is common between them. Then they need to do the augmented reality and the virtual reality in that place 
in each uh, country, in each city. Link this on the map and interlink the themes in co-spaces. So you will seemingly be able to jump between Timisoara and Romania in a virtual space and see is, are there any differences to buy a Starbucks coffee or a muffin in Timisoara or in Waltham and how all of these are, uh, are related together. So uh, basically, these are a screenshot from, <laughs> from this uh, Starbucks example. Uh, there are videos of some of them, and I'll put the links here, because unfortunately, it's very difficult to play the videos in, in Adobe Connect. And here you can see the, in the left um, the image from which is coming from Cross Spaces. Then Dani Norazma in the middle is augmented reality. And then in the a picture, a screenshot from a view through cardboard or through uh, using cardboard uh, and their mobile phones to be able to see. Uh, this is the video, one of the videos which are probably I'm very sorry I can't really show it. What I want to show to you is how easy it is to design with code spaces. So why I believe that neither not only students but even probably children from eight, nine, ten years on and we have experience on showing that they can do it, uh, can learn on uh, and coding and do things with code spaces as a very, sim very simple or basic thing, because it's very simple with Blockly. Blockly is a standard uh, um, software, which nowadays is standard curriculum, not only in Europe, but also in the United States for quite a lot of children. And it's just dragging blocks of code and so on and adjusting them and playing, and then you can see how it's working in, in real time. So it's very, very simple and easy to use. Uh, I'm very proud that through the uh, digital uh, skills, comp digital competencies for creative industries workshops, uh, which we run uh, quite a lot. And one of my, uh, I think, colleagues from Tinshara mentioned about this in the chat. We've been able to train people from uh, biology, from archeology, span from social sciences, to do simple things and simple virtual reality things with cross spaces. I really encourage you to try to do it. There are a lot of tutorials and a lot of examples of doing this. And the code, as you can see, is quite simple, simple and it's quite easy to do. This is also the JFK library in Boston because we've done a library in Timshar and then a library in Boston. And it's very nice when you have a small window or a small button where the character is going around and then you press on that button and then it's jumping in the different things from Boston to Timshara and shows how differently and you can move around, how differently or commonly, <laughs> in some cases, the, the experiences and the environment. I'll put this link here because this link is something which I had on the on YouTube. So it's much more easier for you to play because I cannot play it. So you will be able to see. This is the Timshara Cathedral, a very beautiful, famous cathedral in, uh, in Byzantine style. And it was shot, as you see, during Christmas time, and the students have made very nice things, even introducing a cat in the, in the cathedral, which is not usually uh, really able to do, but they introduced a cat in their scene, and uh, that, was, that has made a bit of a viral, this video, when it, uh, it was released uh, through our open education platform. This is a screen capture again, which shows uh, the AR in co-spaces, and then the virtual reality in Orasma. As I said, nowadays Orasma is actually. Uh, so you can really see uh, that using the same place, the same knowledge, students have been able to create uh, a different experience, but a seamless experience. A different experience using different technology, but which can say probably the same story in different perspective and I have this video also here so I will be able to share it with you uh, as the next video which I can't play here <laughs> so you can click on YouTube and you you will be able to, to see so as I said all of this because uh, we consider this as, a, as open education resources and we use them also not only for touristic reasons but also for educational purposes and cultural purposes to show differences between the cultures and how the city looks like, is uh, put on uh, the last one, last year one on VMAP. They are integrated also in other uh, the other platform, and we have a mobile app which is called Arteme, Artemisara. We show several examples of the students' uh, work, which was completely independently created. 
obviously we run, as I said, a bit of research on when we are doing this. We are doing now for 10 years, so we try to refine and try to identify their motivation and their attitudes towards learning by using VR and so on. And uh, we run a questionnaire to all of our students, and this is the result. So you can see that almost very, very little of them, very few of the students, have been able to use occasionally or, or very rarely uh, virtual reality and so on in different contexts. And um, obviously, quite a lot of that came through the Pokemon game, which was very popular, probably, when they were a bit younger, <laughs> and even now sometimes. We asked them about augmented reality apps and how they'd been able to use them and how much it was their experience international or locally, because we are trying also to prove this international dimension through VR and AR that it works and it can enhance and motivate uh, the students. And you can see that uh, they consider, especially ROAR and so on, which are completely virtual reality experiences, uh, um, um, an easier tool to be used as the best tool to be used in a project in uh, augmented reality by the international space too. They done code spaces basically because it's easier and simple to use, but they also use other tools to produce their things. And uh, we also have some students which are doing things in Unity, which I haven't included in this presentation because that requires a bit more um, uh, software skills or uh, programming skills than code spaces, which is very simple. So this is um, basically the experience with students. Would you be able to conclude now so that we Sorry? can go over to, um, would yes, you be able I to conclude now so we can go over to questions? Just wrap up. Uh, Just a concluding question? statement, if you wish. So basically, uh, this shows that all of these tools that uh, we can have uh, creative creators, and these are my students through a live presentation between Romania and Boston, where we, they can share and they can present jointly. And we came up with a new project, which is funded by the European Union, and I'm showing it here only to encourage the audience to, uh, how to say, to provide information and examples of how uh, digital culture can be improved through different tools. And basically, we are looking at examples of virtual reality, uh, art and technology mixture, where um, virtual reality can be used as a mixture between art, science, and technology, or how it can be done. This is me, uh, next to Sophia, <laughs> which is uh, a, a robot, which uh, the humanoid robot, which is probably uh, when I asked her what she thinks about virtual reality last year when I met, in fact, this year in May when I met her, she said virtual reality is the future where I will, I'm going to live. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, if, if, if it was audio, you'd hear people doing that. <laughs> but uh, I, I like the fact that you were trying to um, mix the um, both the, the um, augmented and virtual reality kind of applications together and to try and compare them in some way. But um, I mean, let, let's try and do that to start with, shall we? Um, because they have different, um, I, I suppose, functionalities. They also have different affordances to them. Um, it's a bit like comparing apples with pears, really, isn't it, or apples and oranges. But um, if you had a choice, which way would you go? Would you go down the VR route or would you go down the AR route? If we are speaking about augmentation, I think AR, augmented reality, is already here. And that's basically a very inexpensive way where we can do an enhancement. We have, for example, in the mechanical faculty, mm -hmm. several examples done where, especially with big engines or with different things, where we've done um, um, quite a lot of augmented reality tools. So that even with their simple mobile phones, the students can go and they can go deep and sh see exactly how an engine works. Or, different other tools and so on. So that's just one example which pop in my mind now. But obviously, the examples in biology and medicine were huge, uh, you know, especially in those magic reality. I think I, I think I see um, augmented reality as being very um, highly applicable to, to real life learning, where you're actually out in the streets or in a museum or somewhere, whereas VR has more applications for um, things where places where you couldn't go, like the, beyond Pluto or, or inside the human body as a blood corpuscle. Is that how you see it? 
I can't hear you, Diana. You need to uh, turn your microphone on. Can't hear you. I can't hear you. I think we may have lost your audio. <laughs> Slightly. Yeah. Try to mute it. Try to mute it and unmute it. That's what I had to do. Unmute and uh, mute and then unmute again. Don't Maybe know why. Helps. You try that. I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll come back to you in a minute, Diana. Um, uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll hold the floor open now for anybody who wants to ask any questions of Diana. And also, um, yeah. any questions for the whole panel of three presenters. If you'd like to Can type you... in your questions while we're trying to get Diana's so sound sorry. back. Oh, you're back. I, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Um, well, the same question as before, really, we're, we're talking about the applications of AR against VR. And, um, and I was thinking about, you know, um, AR being useful in, in real world situations, whereas VR is useful in imagined environments or environments which are hard to access. Would that be your view as well? I think we can hear you, but maybe you can't hear me now, is that right? Can you hear, can you hear me now? Me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, good. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Something happened yeah. with my with my my headphones, and I just couldn't hear nothing. I apologize for this. So just to finally finish my idea, and then I'll finish because the time is running out. Uh, basically, virtual reality is a bit more expensive. That's clear. It can provide a better experience, and where it's really mattering, it's good. What I would like to see, especially for the education sector uh, in the future, is to share more of the virtual reality. Nowadays, quite a lot of the virtual reality, for example, which is produced in life sciences or in medical science, is very, very expensive and very difficult to, to hold on, which I don't really consider the right approach. I know it was expensive to be produced, but it's basic knowledge which you are sharing and exposing to all the others. And you can do another version of, I don't know, a premium version or pay only to some bit and the pay of the use. Uh, because we just um, try to introduce virtual reality to the medical students and we've seen how difficult and how expensive it can be for thousands of students to be able to really join in virtual reality. Some fantastic examples which have been developed by, by, by different universities or companies. So basically, if you produce something in virtual reality, try to make it as open as possible and as accessible as possible, because that's the only way how we can uh, move forward and encourage people to use virtual reality in education. Can I come to you, Diana, about your statement about um, creators, you know, um, creative creators, uh, students being involved in generating content? You know, as, as you may know, I was involved in a project many years ago um, called Concede, which was a European funded project to look at user generated content. And one of the things we did there was try and establish some some benchmark um, quality indicators for user generated content. Now, you know where I'm going with this. The, the, the question is, um, if we're getting students who are not necessarily experts, they might be becoming experts, but they are not at the moment experts, to, to co-create content. Where does that leave us in terms of quality of content? Obviously, sometimes, uh, as say, I can say this clearly, I showed you some of the best examples. I have some which are probably not so creative examples, not a very good use of them. Some are blowing our minds completely. Uh, they are more creative than we've been able to imagine. So the quality differs. But the only thing which I can say is that in the whole education, the quality of what the students produce is not the same. But the thing which I'm pretty sure, and we have also done research which can prove this, is that by using collaborative tools uh, as one, and then digital tools to encourage students to become creators, creators of knowledge or information or even apps or something like that, is um, enhancing their willingness to learn for their entire life. That's the first thing which I can say for sure. Secondly, it's enhancing their ability to be more independent learners. 
which is something which I think, especially in this global education system, uh, something which we will thrive <laughs> to have, or to have workers which are independent learners as much as possible. So these are the two things which I can say for sure. Is this quality in education? Are these, uh, how to say, um, assets which we can prove is a better education or a worse education? I'm not a quality expert. We have Eba here, I think, which is a, a quality expert in Eden, and she's, I'm very sure that she will be able to either enhance or destroy my idea. But after 20, 20 something years of doing this as a teacher or as an educator and as a developer, I can strongly say, as I said, also not only my own opinion, but also research based, that encouraging students, even a tiny bit of creation, if they do it, and especially if they do it in teams collaboratively, um, is a better education model <laughs> than anything else. Thank you, Diana. I, 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 I get from you that. Um, this is a wide ranging set of applications, but there is still the issue of cost. Now, there seems to be a bit of a disagreement here going on. Maybe I can provoke this somehow. But um, you say that um, you made a statement that VR is very expensive. Maybe I can come to Susan and Marcia. Would you agree with that statement that VR is, is expensive? Or um, would, you, would you see um, areas where it could be reduced in cost? Would you disagree with that? Well, certainly expensive. This is Susan. Can you hear me? Uh, it's, it's certainly expensive to create given the type of cameras that are, are required and so on. Um, but there's so many open education resources now. I think uh, that, that we can expose uh, our students to so many uh, different open resources. The difficulty is that somebody has to curate that content because if faculty experts in, in the field don't take a look at some of these artifacts, we don't want to be sharing artifacts with our students that aren't correct. Um, and uh, so there's an added element of, uh, of this curation that now we're, we're involved in because there is so much content out there. So one of the things that we um, didn't anticipate, but when we shared the V artifacts plus site with, uh, with some of our most seasoned faculty, the first thing they said was, can we mask some of these artifacts if we perceive that maybe they're not the best way to portray um, uh, certain models uh, um, uh, or certain information, uh, which, which of course they can. Second of all, they wanted to be able to rank or score or rate each of the different artifacts that were in the repository, because some of them might be better for graduate students, some might be better for undergraduate students, and they they also wanted to share their opinions. Faculty really like to share their opinions about these artifacts. So so some of them did don't think that a particular 360 degree uh, panorama is the is the best portrayal of of, uh, of, of an event or, or a location. And others have different opinions, and it might be better used in a different course. So I think allowing faculty to have a role in the curation of, of some of these artifacts is important, uh, just from a quality standpoint and, uh, and usability standpoint. And second of all, giving faculty an opportunity to comment, rank, score um, them in terms of their appropriate use uh, and the opportunity to even mask some content and say, we, honestly, we don't think this is factual. Uh, uh, it's not research based. It's not what we want to use. Uh, I, I think that's where we're really going to next because there's so much content that's mm. out there. And good points there. I, I, I take it, um, Marcia, you wanted to say something. Matthew, you want to say something as well, yeah? Yeah, I was, I was going to say that to do AR has always been a lot less expensive than VR and not as complex. To do VR has up till now been almost unaffordable for educational institutions. You almost have to get a grant to be able to do it. But it's, it's come so far in such a short period of time. And I think we're going to see exponentially that happen again. Uh, used to, you had to have the VR headset with, that were tethered. You had to have computer technology, almost its own server to create some VR. 
um, experiences. And now um, you have companies like NVIDIA that have created a, a laptop that allows you to create some of your own uh, high-end VR experiences without all of the extra equipment. So that actually enables you to go outside of a studio to work. That's just one of the steps I'm talking about when I say that the technology uh, to do, the cost of the technology has come way down while the capabilities of it has dramatically in improved. Now, if I could turn from the idea of cost and, and utility and, and functionality more towards pedagogy, towards the teaching and learning aspects of this, because I'm sure we're all fascinated with that. Um, there, there, are, there are many um, of theories that I suppose we could apply to this to try and um, explain how VR allows us to learn in a better way. Um, but one of the things that has been touched upon but hasn't really been made explicit in this webinar so far is the idea that we can co-learn, that we can learn together in the social learning or the, construct, the social constructive aspects, if you like, of learning. How, how um, this is a question for all three of you and maybe for also for the audience who, who might want to type in their responses as well. How, how can VR facilitate social constructivism? How can it facilitate negotiation of meaning, um, you know, co-learning, all of those kind of concepts? Does anyone want to take that on? You're all thinking. <laughs> I want to give Diana a chance. Diana, did you want to take it be first? Did you want, Diana, did you yeah. want to say something? Yes. Um, uh, it's a it's a it's uh, it's a very difficult uh, not to say question in a way, and I'm afraid to a very large audience to to say something which is really uh, deep in my soul or something which I really believe it can be can be done. But basically, how to say um, if you look at them, uh, how it they were. I mean, both of these tools, virtual reality and augmented reality, how they were some days ago. I mean, years ago. They, they've been just for a few. Nowadays, we see primary school children and primary teachers doing examples of, I've seen a, an amazing dance by a German uh, teacher, which is teaching kids from five to nine years old about the lake, which is near their, their city, and uh, to learn everything about biology and geography and water and chemistry and everything. So it's, this new trend of having combined curriculum, combined subjects in one project where you can do something. And with VR and AR, you can really do it and make children curious about that and motivate them to do it better. Because being honest, is the tools, these are the tools which they use quite a lot at home. I'm a, a, a very young grandmother and um, our two-year niece, the first word which she learned was, hey, Alexa. So I, I can't say nothing more than this. So I, I really i am scared what we're going to do in a very traditional education setting, which we have usually in Europe, especially at the best schools or, or the most old schools and old universities, when these children, which are growing up fully digital, fully, fully digital and fully immersed in in virtual reality and augmented reality, will be able to to really, uh, how to say, um, learn uh, traditional subjects about history and biology or even math and how we are going to make them more curious. But as I said, I'm a computer scientist, I'm an engineer. Uh, my instructional or pedagogical experience is only based on courses and things like that which I've done and experience. So I really think, Steve, is your job. <laughs> you are coming from the pedagogical sector <laughs> to tell us, <laughs> are we doing right or wrong, and which is going to be the impact, and how this will change the whole education sector or not? Definitely throwing the ball back into my part of the court in, in, in um, Halep uh, style, I think, there, as, as I quote an old Romanian uh, tennis player. Yeah. <laughs> so, Marcy, uh, I'll come to you. Same question. Um, what, what do you think? Uh, is there a pedagogy that explains um, VR learning? 
You know, they're actually, I wish I could share it right now. Have you seen how AVR is actually one of the first technologies that fully uh, embrace Bloom's taxonomy? I have a, uh, a picture of it. If I could, if you could show me how I could share it. Um, that really, it, it talks about how. I'll show you a screen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you. All right, hold on. Let me pull it up. I'm going to share a window. Well, I'll just share a desktop and I'll make it bigger. Oh, yes. Let me make it bigger. There we go. And so if you look at this, I love this. Um, so you look at how traditionally pedagogy addresses the bottom career, uh, levels of remember and understand and apply. And then augmented reality takes it to the next level, uh, breaking down the information part into component parts and so forth. I love that virtual reality hits the create level. And I think with tools like Tour Creator, for example, with Google, and that can be at all um, education levels from uh, early childhood up through postgraduate and then level of the pedagogical um, approach of, of enlading, en enabling our instructors to um, grab and create. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, so I, to, to answer your question, Steve, I think we with VR and AR, AVR, mixed reality, as the uh, technologies become more affordable, I think from pedagogical approach, we will be able to incorporate not only the way we present, so the teaching, but the learning as well, and the way the students can digest the information and learn to teach themselves, uh, creating some incredible yeah. VR experience. It does, and, that and that's sense. a really useful model, I think everyone will agree. I, I, yeah, it is Lauren Anderson's um, revamped version of Bloom's Taxonomy, by the way, uh, but it's very, very useful to, to see where all of the different technologies kind of fit into that hierarchy, if you like, of, of, of different cognitive um, learning levels. Susan, did you have anything to add to that at all? We're going to have to stop in a moment, but one, maybe final comment from you. Uh, I, I wanted to add something. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add sort of a little bit of a twist on this in terms of the multidisciplinary opportunities that are available uh, with virtual reality. Uh, our researchers in our media uh, and design uh, school uh, uh, worked with our physical therapy department uh, in our College of Nursing and Health Professions. For, for patients who are in physical therapy, they've always had to go to a, a physical location uh, while they're trying to recover in order to have a therapist work with them for range of motion uh, and so on during their recovery. The virtual reality team was able to literally design uh, a game uh, and uh, that captured the exercises in the exact range of motion that, that the patients that were in physical yeah. therapy needed so they could practice at home. So these multidisciplinary approaches of, and, and collaborations I don't know if it addresses your pedagogy perspective, but it's really opened new horizons in terms of, of, of creating innovative ways and experiences for us to um, help uh, patients um, uh, improve their uh, range of motion in, in a, a therapy environment. I, I think it does address the, the question in, in some ways because you're talking there about very immersive participatory uh, and I, I suppose active forms of learning, uh, which clearly is, is what we're all trying to do with technology enhanced yeah. learning of all types, isn't it? I think we'd all agree on that. And um, I, I think on that very, very positive, upbeat note, we're going to have to draw a close to this uh, 90 minutes of fabulous, I'd say epic, you know, discussion around um, these new technologies as they emerge. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Susan over in uh, Pennsylvania. Marcy in Texas, and Diana over in Romania, um, and of course myself here in the UK. It's been a truly international experience, as we can expect from Eden. Uh, thank you all for, for, for coming in uh, virtually to talk about your, your, your subjects today, and uh, for giving us that incredible amount of information and, and thought-provoking 
uh, content to, to go away and ruminate on. And also thank you to everybody who's taken part virtually from wherever you are in the world, um, from the US and, and from Europe, and maybe even farther afield. Uh, thank you for staying the course. I hope you've enjoyed that, and uh, I've certainly enjoyed sharing it. Um, goodbye, and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. You the next webinar tomorrow. <laughs> yeah.